Hello, this is Mark White with Ascension Hydraulics. Thanks for tuning in. And in this tutorial, I want to better illustrate how hydraulic schematics are meant to be depicted by comparing these schematic symbols to cross-sectional views of real-world hydraulic components. So we basically constructed the same circuit schematically as we have with animated cross-sections here to better illustrate how valves move, how cylinders move, how fluid flows in a hydraulic circuit. So the first part of the tutorial, what I want to do is I want to go over the schematic symbols and I want to talk about each one and then compare it to its animated cross-sectional view here. And we'll do that for each component. And the second part of the tutorial, we're actually going to add the animation to it. That is, we're going to have things move here. We're going to do a couple cycles where we move this, extend out this cylinder and retract it back. And in that process you will see valve shifting, gauges moving, and fluid flowing. So, to start off, schematically, the first component in our circuit is a fixed displacement pump. And it doesn't, this schematic symbol does not specify what kind of fixed displacement pump. Could be a piston pump, it could be a gear pump, it could be a vein pump, but if we look at the corresponding animated symbol, it's obviously a gear pump because we can see the two gears meshing. So that's the first component. The second component is a relief valve, a common component used in hydraulic circuits to control and limit pressures. And the way it works is when the uh, pressure from the pump comes, and if there's no path of resistance lower than the setting of this relief valve, what you'll get is you'll actually you'll get this upstream pressure at one will actually move to m envision this arrow shifting over to allow flow to go from one to two into tank. And it's the same thing here. One is the inlet in this animated depiction. Two is the outlet. And if the pressure at one is such that it exceeds the spring setting of the relief valve, it'll actually move the pop it off land and open up a flow path <clears throat> from one to two. The next component is a four port three position directional valve. And what does that mean? Well the four ports are P, T, A, and B and the three positions from left to right are this crossover position where as the arrows indicate you can envision P going to B and A going back to T the second position is a center position. In this case, we have P is actually blocked in the center position, but A and B go to T. Another name for that spool configuration is the float position. And our far right position would be P going straight through to A and B coming back to T. So P going to A and B going back to T. And if we look at our cross section view of the component here, it's the same depiction. In our center position, which it's shown here, B, P, the pressure, goes right up and it's blocked. It can't go anywhere because it's blocked by the spool lands. A, as you can see right there, has space over the land right there where it's going to go around the spool and come back to T. And same with B. B has a space right here because there's no land blocking it. It's going to come right over the spool and go to T. So the other two positions of this spool are much easier to visualize when we get to part two of this tutorial when we bring the animated circuits into it. But for now, what you would have to envision is if this spool shifts to the left here, what would happen is this pressure coming in at the P port here would actually be exposed to the A port, if you can envision this spool shifting over. That correlates with this position right here with P going to A. And at the same time, uh, B is already exposed to T in the center position, but it would be, get a, probably even have a little bit less of a pressure drop because this spool would shift over more and make the passage to from B to T um, that much less restrictive. So that's what's going on when the spool would shift left. And when that happens and we put pressure and flow into port A, we know that our cylinder is going to extend. <clears throat> if it goes the other way and it shifts to the right, same thing. You've got to envision this P pressure here 
once this spool comes off its land, it's going to open up a flow path to B, and that'll end up at port 2 of our counterbalance valve. So this spool shifting to the right would be equivalent to this spool position coming over here in our schematic P to B, A to T. And when pressure goes into this B port, it goes into port 2 of the counterbalance valve. Well, what is the counterbalance valve? Counterbalance valves jobs are to manage loads coming from, manage pressures and flows coming from overrunning loads. So what you have to envision, and it's not depicted here, is something trying to pull the cylinder out, make it extend, uh, some kind of a load on the rod. Uh, maybe if it was mounted a certain way, it could be a gravitational type load, depending on how it's oriented. But we don't want this cylinder to run away from us when we're extending it, okay? Because that could make the pump cavitate, that could uh, make us get air in the system. And more importantly, we want to have precise control of the load. We want to be able to modulate it properly and safely. So that's what the counterbalance valve does. So the counterbalance valve is a three port device. It has ports one, two, and three, just like here in this depiction of the cross section port one, two, and three. And what happens is when a counterbalance valve always, well, I don't know about always, usually has a free flow check valve on this side to allow flow to go in the side of the actuator where you're not trying to modulate flow. So right here you've got a free flow check valve so flow can go from two to one relatively easily. It's just got to overcome the cracking pressure of that check valve. So likewise here. 2 to 1 would be over this. This is the poppet type check valve here. Once the pressure reaches the cracking pressure of this small check valve, then you're going to get flow from 2 to 1. Okay, 2 to 1, and that will make the cylinder retract, obviously. 2 to 1 will make the cylinder retract. Going the other way, it's a little more complicated. If this cylinder is trying to extend and flow is coming out of the rod end, what happens? Well, if it comes into port 1, it can't go around that same check valve to port 2 because it's blocked. It'll seat that check right there. So it has to work over this counterbalance valve. And for that to happen, it needs to have a pilot signal at port 3. Okay? So if we are to extend this cylinder at all, we need to have a pilot signal from port A here into port 3 of our counterbalance valve moving the counterbalance valve piston off of its land to allow flow from 1 to 2. Again, this will be something that's much easier to visualize once we get to the animation. But for now, that's how a counterbalance valve works. Here's a schematic. Here's a cross-sectional view of one. Spring adjustment here. Spring here. Check valve right here. Check valve here. The cylinder is the easiest component to draw a correlation between from the schematic to the real world symbol. Here's our schematic symbol. Here's the real world symbol. Um, they're both double acting, meaning they go in both directions. It's not a single acting cylinder. If you want to extend it, you've got to put flow on the piston end here. If you want to retract it, you've got to put flow on the rod end here. Same thing with the schematic symbol.